We'll talk about fossils and time this afternoon. A little different topic. There are two kind of big areas of, of research uh, relevant to this um, question of creation and evolution. Uh, in biology, living cells, how do they work, how do they evolve, geology and paleontology, rocks and fossils. Now, from the point of view of a person doing research, trying to figure these out, can you see an important difference between them? Anything strike you right off? What, pardon? One's alive and one's dead. Okay, that's, that's a good uh, approach to it. Um, this we talked about this morning, um, biological things, biochemistry. People studying these are studying things that are alive right in front of them. They're studying processes happening over and over again all the time right in front of us. That doesn't mean it's easy. The, the, the life is so complex, it's very difficult to understand it many times. But nevertheless, we're studying things that are alive. You can do your experiments and your observations over and over again. Okay, how about this geology and paleontology? We're studying things that happened a long time ago. We weren't there to see it. Um, so how are we going to do that? Well, it's just, it's very different. This is much more difficult. We, we, we study the rocks and the fossils and we tell stories how we think they got there. How do you demonstrate whether those are right or not? It's, it's very difficult. Um, up here in biology, that's where the theory of evolution is, is in increasingly deeper trouble. Because of new discoveries, studying things that we can study in the lab right in front of our noses. Uh, it's, it's more challenging here <clears throat> in geology and paleontology. Nevertheless, we're making progress, but still you, you can't go back and see what happened. We have to assume that the processes that made these rocks and that buried the fossils are, are like what happens on the earth today. But in many ways, they're not. And so it is a challenge. But we're going to do what we can this afternoon. Okay, here. Um, okay. Does the Bible say anything about time in earth history? Well, yeah, it does. Uh, in Genesis, we have some... Some specific genealogies that, that have a formula. So-and-so lived so many years and begat so-and-so, and they lived so many years. That's, good. That's a formula that, that seems to indicate real time. Some of the other genealogies have people list, left out and things, but those seem to indicate time. Uh, we still don't know exactly. There are a couple of an different ancient translations of the Bible, uh, different originals, and, and they differ one of them, somebody messed with the numbers. They either added 100 years for each person or just subtracted. So 6,000 to 7,000 years is the kind of time it gives us. And then there are other time. So we don't know exactly. But the real issue is this. Was there a literal creation a few thousand years ago? Or did life evolve over hundreds of millions of years? That's, those are, that's really the choice uh, we have to make. And we're going to talk about what geology might... Um, have to say about this uh, this afternoon. <clears throat> okay, fossils, fascinating things. There's a very beautiful fossil bat. Happens to be the oldest known fossil bat. Uh, leaves, turtles. Um, okay, next. Um, here are some things that we actually bought in here in Tucson at the Rock and Mineral Show. Uh, these wonderful fish and, and palm fronds, trilobites. This little thing, you couldn't tell what it is, but this is the head of a trilobite, and there's his compound eye, just like the eyes on flies. Okay, that's an er early you know, Cambrian fossil. Wonderful, intricate structure. <clears throat> dinosaurs. Everybody loves dinosaurs, at least all the kids do. And there are some beautiful skeletons of them, um, some that are not so good. And it's, one can go out and dig in the rocks and look for fossils, looking for fossil turtles here in this, this play case. Um, and prepare the fossils and study them. It's very interesting. Uh, or you can find bigger things. Here we have digging up a fossil whale in Peru. The questions and the challenges. Fossils, rocks, and dates. How much time? Does, what, what kind of, and this is really the question when we get to, to uh, rocks and fossils. How much time? When did this all happen? And one of our major questions, of course, is radiometric dates. Um, the, the dates that are, here's the representation of the, what we call the geologic column. You have layers of rock, one above the other, uh, various places of the earth. You find these, um, 
Here in the west, we have a nice sampling of this geologic column. Grand Canyon, you have these what we call Paleozoic rocks. Zion Park and, and areas around there, we have uh, Mesozoic and then uh, Bryce Canyon and others. The, the, the fossils near the, the rocks and fossils near the top. Okay, so <clears throat> the, the ages, the, the ages that geologists give to these are uh, 541 million years for this place right here, the bottom of the Cambrian. That's a lot, that's a lot of years, 541 million years, and it goes on up until the present day. Okay, so what do we say about that? Well, <clears throat> we don't know. <laughs> I mean, that, that's one of our big questions. We don't really know the answer to that yet. There are, there are things, I will predict that there are things to be discovered that will show that, that there are things about those radiometric processes that we really don't understand. And because I don't believe the time is long like that. I think God, who gave us the Bible, knows more about that than, than anybody else. But that's a question we still just don't know. But um, so is that, do we have to just say, well, you know, wring our hands and say, well, that's a problem? No, because there are other lines of evidence we can study. The fossil sequence, okay, we've got the time. We also have this fossil sequence here in the rocks. Um, up here are, are, we find fossil humans and we find horses and a, a lot of the creatures that we know so well. Um, we don't find those right down here. We find invertebrates, um, li things living in the ocean. Now, if this is the result of the, of, the, of the flood, of course, you wouldn't necessarily expect to find people and monkeys down in the ocean, in ocean deposits. So that's, it's not as though it's all a puzzle. Some things are, make sense. We have uh, marine things here that would live in the ocean. Uh, pretty soon we find amphibians and then reptiles, and then the first mammals and the first birds. And the th creatures we know the best, we find up here. So <clears throat> some of that is, can be explained uh, with not too much trouble. Other parts of it, we don't really understand why it's that way. Why you don't have, uh, why didn't you get at least a few mice caught in this catastrophe down here? Well, we don't know the answer to that. So the, the radiometric dates and some aspects of this fossil sequence are things that we still puzzle over a lot. But let's go on. Finding answers. In many other ways, we can find good answers to understand better. <clears throat> Fossils, rocks, and original research. Um, well, okay, first of all, we'll look at, at well-preserved fossils. These fossils, this is a thing called a mesosaur. It, it's beautiful. Every bone is in place. Uh, these starfish are exquisitely preserved. Uh, these uh, ammonites, well-preserved. Next. Uh, here's a, um, a dragonfly, the wings, everything is preserved. How do you do that? You know, you used to read in, in books some years ago that fossils take millions of years to form. Well, in recent years, there have been experiments actually studying how this happens. And now we know a lot more. And now it's understood that something either fossilizes quite quickly or not at all. And rocks and minerals, uh, coal can be formed in the lab in, a, in months. Um, Fossils of some kinds can be formed very quickly. And these things, if they don't get buried and taken out of, uh, away from the atmosphere and out of, uh, from decay quickly, they just won't get preserved. Look at these things. These are fly larvae. They don't have bones. These are just soft tissue. These are all beautifully preserved. They had to be buried very quickly uh, in order to be fossilized. Otherwise, they would not fossilize at all. <clears throat> So, and there are an awful lot of very well-preserved fossils in the record. The, that speaks to, to rapid burial. Here's some interesting ones. There's a, a deposit called the Green River Formation. It's, it's in Wyoming and Colorado and Utah. Um, and everything is beautifully preserved. This big dish turtle, uh, every bone is in place. Uh, I did research, which I'll tell you about in a few minutes, in, in another deposit in Wyoming. And there are lots of turtles. The shells are pretty much there. The heads are gone. The limbs are mostly gone. So something was different there. But here, every bone is in place. And look at this thing. Anybody guess what that is? Pardon? OK, good guesses. This is called a coprolite. It's fossilized dung. Okay, so here we've got a, a, this is about an inch long, 
Here we got a piece, probably fossilized uh, crocodile poop. <laughs> All right, uh, and there's a lot of a lot of coprolites. Um, and this is in a in a rock that is in fine laminations, fine layers, which most geolo many geologists think are varves, or one lamination formed each year in a lake. All right, I put this rock under a microscope and counted. There's 180 layers here. Okay, what, what do you think is the possibility that this thing lay on the bottom of this lake for 180 years beauty, is beautifully preserved? There's just no way. It, it, it had to have been varied very fast. There's something that's making these laminations very fast that we don't understand. But it, it can't be any other way. Um, it, it just, nothing is going to lay there that long and be preserved. And so there's, um, fossils often tell us that things happen quickly. <coughs> Now, if, if all these creatures evolved, or the result of evolution, um, then um, through time you should have had preserved fossils of the different kinds of creatures, and as they were evolving you should get fossils showing the different changes in the evolution process. So intermediates between different groups, fossil intermediates. Charles Darwin struggled over this problem that the fossil record did not show that. That this he saw as one of the big problems for his theory, that the, these intermediates showing the evolution process were not there. He predicted that as time went on, we'd find them. We just hadn't looked enough. Well, that's been 100 and what, 50 years ago? More than that. Uh, and they haven't been, well, there are some things that they call uh, intermediates, but we don't have time to get into details on that. Well, let's just look at the main, the bigger questions about intermediates. They're not there. Um, a clam is a clam all the way through the record. Um, an insect is an insect all the way through. Um, and so for the, as far as the bigger groups, the, the intermediates are just not there, and they haven't been found. And the fact that we've looked so much through the decades uh, and I haven't found them makes the case even stronger that they, they well, they're not there. It, doesn't look like things evolved, like these major groups evolved. Sure, we have ch small changes, new species develop an adaptation to, envir to the environments. But as far as the big changes, they don't seem to be there. In fact, here's this um, Cambrian explosion would be right there. All these, all the phyla, all the major groups shown here are represented in fossils right here at the bottom. <coughs> and You've probably all seen these evolutionary the phylogenetic trees pictured, where you, this represents the, the pathways of evolution of different animals. And if life has it evolved, here is what we should see. We should see, first of all, this P represents a phylum. A phylum is like, like worms and insects, um, vertebrates, um, you know, different major groups of organisms. You should have some kind of creatures e appearing first, uh, protozoa and things. And then it should take a long time before the next phylum evolves. Because that's a major, you know, if that could even happen at all, that's a major change. So another one here and maybe another one there, another couple hundred million years later and so on. Uh, they should gradually appear, but that's not the way it is. This is what the record shows. This is the bottom of the Cambrian. All these phyla are right there all of a sudden. And any changes are just small changes within each of these. These dotted lines are all uh, theoretical. They know, there are no fossils to, in, to support this. And so it doesn't fit uh, Darwin's theory. So that's a, that's a serious problem there in the rocks uh, for that theory. Talk about coal. Coal is very interesting. How did coal form? Here's a, uh, a picture from a, a coal mine in Wyoming. All this black material is coal and it occurs in, in layers, one layer above the other. Uh, this is a very thick layer. This is sitting on top of it. And this is not flat because they bulldoze it off. That's the way it comes. Coal is in these very flat layers, often very thick layers. Uh, this is, uh, I don't know, 20, 30 feet thick. This is the same. Sometimes they're much thicker. Um, and here, you, this is the the wall of the mine, they've taken out these other layers above it. So these are not just lines on the hillside. These are layers that go back maybe a hundred miles. They're, they're very widespread layers of coal. Okay, so how did that form? 
Well, if you take this, the, what we call a conventional geological theory, millions of years, you, you try to explain things by processes that you can see happening right now. Well, there are places where you can go to um, um, swamps, call, uh, peat swamp, coal, and, well, peat swamps where plants are growing, trees are growing, and they die, and they fall to the bottom, and they kind of build up a layer of organic material there. And that's the way the standard geology, conventional geology, explains coal. But this happened over millions of years. This, this peat gradually accumulated uh, and built up layer after layer and made this peat. Well, <clears throat> a geologist friend of mine described that as the lamest theory in geology. So why did he say that? Because you've got this very thick layer that's nice and even on the top and the bottom. And then you see these white lines. Those are, are clay, are, are, you know, silt, fine sediment layers. So you have this mass of, co of plant material makes coal. Then you have a fine layer of, of the dirt that gets put on top of it over maybe 50 miles, maybe 100 miles. Then you have another layer of coal, right? If this was actually a peat bog growing this stuff, there would be plants, there would be tree roots growing through it, uh, mixing it all up. There would be living things in there, burrowing, digging around. You should not have any layers like this preserved. This just doesn't fit. Something drastically is wrong with that theory. And I suggest that it's better explained by a catastrophic uh, flood geology theory where you, this catastrophe kills massive amounts of, of plants, material, trees, and other plants. They get s sunk in the water finally and, and compacted down. And then you have layers of, of sediment spread on top of it by the water and then another layer of coal. So <clears throat> a, a lot of these things are, if you, th if you think about it carefully, uh, there are better explanations than the conventional geology explanation. Now, if, you, if a person takes what was called a naturalistic point of view, that is, the assumption that there's no God, there was no global flood, none of this is right, then you have limited options. You have limited possibilities of how to explain this. A person who accepts the Bible seriously, where it talks about a catastrophe, now you have more options, more ways to explain this. And often a catastrophe seems to be a better explanation. Okay, this is uh, something that Dr. Chadwick and I have been studying quite a bit in recent years, bedded sedimentary deposits. Bedded, what do I mean? Uh, these sediments are in layers, and we refer to those as beds. So a bedded rock is something that's in layers. <clears throat> okay, well, so what? Uh, well, it's very common for rocks, in fact, it's generally the case, they show these distinct layers or beds. The Grand Canyon, you have all these layers. This is the limestone, you have the layers have been tilted up now. So, okay, what's the issue with beds? Well, let me illustrate it with an analog. <clears throat> um, here we have a slice of bread. Uh, now, these, these are not just lines on a hillside. These are layers that go back into the rock, just like a, like a, a slice of bread. It's a flat layer and these are these are all flat layers of sand or mud or pebbles that have been washed in by water one layer after another okay so let's look a little more at this piece of bread we add another layer on top another piece of bread okay now if this if this layer is down there and now nothing happens for quite a while if this piece of bread lays there for quite a long time you think about what's going to happen to it uh, in your kitchen, if you just leave it there for a long time, what's going to happen? Well, things are going to start happening. Mold starts growing, uh, you know, if, if it's in the right place, mice might start chewing on it. Uh, things start happening. It will not stay nice, and, nice and, and clear like it was. So then, if you add another slice and, and two, another one, now you've got a stack of bread slices, just like we have a stack of layers here. And you can tell where the, which layer was exposed for a lot of time, because things happened. Uh, well, it's the same thing with rocks. Uh, here, if we, here we have a five or six slices, and it, they've all had a lot of time. Now, these things that are messing around with it, you, you, they may even mess it up so much that you can't even tell where one layer ends and one starts. 
But it's not like that here. You see these beautiful layers. And so what can make this kind of change in the, in the rocks? All right, we see so many rock uh, deposits that are distinctly layers. They have not, the layers have not been destroyed and damaged. So what does it take to do that? Okay, here we have the ocean and a, a nice little pond and lake. If um, when sediments get washed in in layers in these kind of places, they don't lay there undisturbed. There are worms and all kinds of critters that dig in the mud and they dig and they burrow. And just like, here's a little diagram. This is what you find if you dig in the mud here at, underneath this, this um, ocean. Uh, these creatures dig holes, they dig burrows, they burrow through the sediment. There are some, there are a lot of marine creatures that live in the ocean and the, and the lakes. They live by burrowing through the sediment. They take in sediment at one end, they, they get the organic material out of it, and then send the sediment on through. And so, <clears throat> in, nat in a natural situation, layers don't stay nice and undisturbed. They get messed up rather quickly. And you should not see those layers preserved. And so, that being the case, why is it that we have, can see distinct layers uh, in the rocks? Here, there are places where you have evidence of creatures burrowing in the sediment before it became rock. And here are some examples. Here's one where you mostly can see the layers distinctly, but there are a few of these vertical burrows, like escape burrows. Things got covered by sediment and then they tried to escape vertically. Here's one that's much more heavily burrowed. It's just full of these burrows. So we do have some rocks like that. Um, but that's, those, are, those are the exception. Usually it's not like that. Usually they are like this. Not like that, like this. Okay, so why is that? Where were all the creatures that should have been burrowing in the mud? Well, <clears throat> if this was formed very rapidly, then you wouldn't expect to have enough time for all this burrowing to happen, to mess up the layers. Here's a diagram from a book that, that illustrates this. Here are all these layers of sediment. Okay, this one, and th this, these kind of, this is burrowing by creatures. We call it bioturbation. Bio, by living things that are disturbing the sediment. Okay, in this case, it happens so fast that there's not time for any bioturbation. Here you have a little more time. You have a little burrowing here and there. In more time, you have more burrowing. Until finally over here, this is, would be something that deposited very slowly. Lots of time for burrowing creatures to, to mess it up with their burrows and their, their trails. Well, what do we find in the rocks? Usually we find something like, like this over here. Okay, we do find some burrows. We find them here and there through the rocks. So if during the flood, there was obviously, cre there were obviously creatures, living things that were being washed in along with the sediment. And they would dig some, make some burrows, make some tra trails, but not very much. Things were happening much too fast, it appears. Um, now, other geologists, they puzzle over why no more burrowing. Why isn't there? For us, for those of us who believe in the flood, there's kind of a natural explanation. Most of it just happened too fast uh, for all that burrowing to happen. And that would be why we have so much of this nicely laminated rock. Here's a picture in, in Utah. You have all these layers of rock, one above the other. Here they've been, they've been tilted up like this. And, and some of it's eroded off. But these are one layer, one rock formation after another, going up this way. And when you look at these carefully, as, as we have done, looking for burrows, you don't find very much. It, it's really very uncommon. Um, and so the distinct bedding is characteristic of the geologic record. It's not something you find occasionally. That's the way it usually is, indicating uh, probably not enough time for that burrowing to happen. Um, this morning in the hotel, I, I saw the man there at breakfast with an interesting shirt. It had this saying on the back, believe and achieve. <laughs> and he had a quote from Proverbs. So I, I like that. Because uh, the next part of what I'm going to talk about is how we, if we believe, we take the Bible seriously, we can achieve things we would not have otherwise. And we can, I'm going to talk about how we can find answers through research, and this is something that some of us do on a regular basis, looking at the rocks, trying to understand how they really happen. 
um, doing geology and, and paleontology research. We start with a biblical worldview, that is, our understanding of life and of history is based on the Bible. This opens our eyes to see things, new things, that we would not have seen otherwise, and that other people are not seeing. So the Bible story of the flood and of everything opens our eyes, and we often find answers to our questions because we take the Bible seriously. I'm going to tell you about several research projects. Um, first one is a, a project in Wyoming, um, a rock formation called the Bridger Formation. That's in, in southwestern uh, Wyoming. It's very rich in fossils, fossil vertebrates especially, fish, uh, mammals, reptiles, a wide variety of things, including thousands and thousands of turtles. And we studied the turtles. Now, why did we pick on the turtles? Well, the, this formation has been studied since the railroad came through there in 1869. So there have been paleontologists. There are so many beautiful mammal fossils, and that's what they want. They want to study the evolution of mammals. Uh, they don't care about the turtles, and so they ignore the turtles. And one of the, one of the uh, scientists from a uh, museum back east was out there while we were studying, and he said, oh, we tried to ignore the turtles. Well, that's good, because now... If I tried to study mammals, they're mostly gone to museums. But the turtles are still there. We can get um, accurate data on the turtles. So we studied taphonomy of fossil turtles. Now, you, you're very familiar with this word? Probably not. Taphonomy, I would describe um, as the study of dead and rotting things. <laughs> no, that's not very appealing. But what it is is a study of how fossils form. All the processes from, all the processes from death to fossilization, to when you dig up the fossil. That's taphonomy. We're trying to understand how these things got fossilized and why they are where they are. If, um, if you're digging in the rock and you find a beautiful, complete skeleton, that tells you something about how it was buried very quickly. If you find a bone by itself that's broken, okay, that's not just an ugly bone, it tells you something. Why is it there by itself? It got separated from the skeleton, and why is it broken? Okay, all those things can help you to understand how it got, how it got there. Okay, um, this is the, the Bridger Formation. <clears throat> here we have a whole group digging up fossils out of this, uh, this clay. And here are three of us who worked together on, on this uh, project. And we had students who worked with us quite a lot. And there are a variety of, we do, you do find some mammals that other people have overlooked. Here's a beautiful little skull. That's a quarter, so it's a very small skull. That one's now is in the American Museum in New York. But turtles is what we especially find. Here's a turtle shell. It, as, as it erodes out of the ground, it begins to fall apart. Here are two nice turtles. This one uh, hadn't been exposed long enough to fall apart. And so he's, he's a beautiful specimen. And here's one that had fallen apart. It was just a pile of bones. And a student put it back together for me. <clears throat> and that, that's a turtle about, about this long. So it's a pretty good sized turtle. Well, when we got there, a, a graduate student and I first started looking over this research area, about maybe 11 acres, and this layer of clay. And we started putting these yellow flags by wherever there was a turtle. Now, this one is, hasn't been exposed. It hasn't fallen apart. If, if erosion uh, exposes a turtle, it'll fall apart, and you end up with a pile of bones. Okay, so you know that's one turtle. One or two, sometimes two in, in a pile. But you know there's at least one. And so we put these flags around <coughs> all over the place, and you see there are a lot of flags. Uh, in fact, in, in, a, in an 11 acres area, it looks like this. There were about 350 turtles. That's a lot of turtles. Uh, there are little flags all over the place. So why are there so many turtles? Um, so, so how many, that's one question. Why are they like they are? That's another question. And what we usually find there are shells, turtle shells, complete or more or less complete, with no heads and not very many limbs. Now, one of the joke, the joke in camp was someday we're going to find a big pile of skulls someplace. <laughs> we never did find that pile of skulls. But uh, why are they? Well, first of all, something to, to think about. 
There's a process that animals go through when they die. If you find a dead cat with the road, you can kick it in the ditch and you can go every day and take notes on it. What's going on? Well, you'll find that there's a sequence of processes that happen. Uh, the, the insects come and take out the, the flesh inside. Finally, the, the skin starts to fall apart and the bones start to separate. So here's a, a cow made a bad mistake, tried to cross this cattle guard. And he got stuck and died there. When we first saw him, the insect larvae had mostly cleared out the tissue inside. And through time, through the years after that, the bones uh, fall apart, they, they start to break down. So there's a process. Now, if you find hundreds of, of um, creatures all in the same stage of decay, it tells you something. They were all killed at the same time. I saw a picture taken in Russia that showed exactly this situation. It was taken during the First World War. Um, for some reason, the people were not able to take care of their horses. So here's a field full of horse skeletons, all complete. They all died at the same time. Whereas if they died you know, through the years and through the seasons, they'd be in all different stages of decay. Well, our turtles are all in the same stage of decay. So at least in each layer, there's only a few layers that have turtles. And in each layer, they're all beautifully. So they were all killed at the same time. Okay, well, I <clears throat> uh, don't have a picture for this next part. But anyhow, they were all killed at the same time and buried quite quickly. From our studies on, on living turtles, we know that this had to happen within a, a few months at most. So you have all these turtles were killed, and we can, we can tell by the geology why they were killed. The sediment there is all volcanic, coming from a volcanic uh, a range up to the north in, in, around Yellowstone Park. Okay, so... Apparently there was a, an eruption started. You have all this ash coming. It's, it fills the valleys, it kills all the turtles, and buries them quickly. And then more sediment, more of this uh, volcanic sediment. And finally it stops. More water comes in, you get another lake, more turtles, and then it, it happens again. And so what we found that nobody else had noticed is that, that this is mass mortalities um, buried very rapidly. Each layer was the same. A mass mortality built rapidly, uh, um, buried rapidly. Why hadn't they noticed that? Well, it doesn't really, f I mean, other geologists recognize that catastrophes happen, small catastrophes, but they don't expect them on a normal basis. And so nobody had really paid attention. The fact that we take a Bible point of view causes us to ask questions that they're not asking. Like, how, how widespread was this? How catastrophic was it? Um, they're not asking those questions, so they never notice the things that we noticed. But we notice them, and we, we study them, and if you study carefully, uh, you can if actually get your results published in good journals. Um, and here's some more, uh, uh, two major papers on, the, on the whole, this whole process of how these got buried. Um, now, when, when you do this, we have to be careful what we say. Because to me, this is all indication that this is in a catastrophic, major catastrophic process. I would say from the other evidence, probably not in the main part of the flood, but right at the end. Um, now, we wouldn't dare say that in a, in a scientific article. And our data actually can't demonstrate that. But we can demonstrate that this all happened very fast. And if you if you careful and stick with what you can really show from your evidence, you can get it published. <clears throat> so we would leave our, our beautiful camp there in, in the Bridger Badlands and head to another research project. And leave the Bridger Sphinx to take care of our fossils. Okay, another, another project. <clears throat> fossil vertebrate trackways in the Permian Coconino Sandstone, uh, Arizona. These are all fossil animal tracks. And this deposit, the only fossils you find in this sandstone are these animal tracks. Okay, next. And this is in a sandstone we find in northern Arizona, the Grand Canyon. You see this whitish layer all on the, near the top? That's the Coconino sandstone. Three to five hundred feet thick in this area. All sand, just pure sand. And the only fossils are these animal tracks. Now tracks 
are, are, are very interesting in, in various ways. Here's a specimen that came from that same formation. And you have here what I call fossilized animal behavior. Here is a, the trackway of some kind of an invertebrate. He's coming down here, cruising down across the sand. This, of course, at that time was just sand, not sandstone. He's coming down here, and then here's another trackway that comes across. This is probably either a reptile or amphibian. You notice this guy is coming down, this one's coming across. They meet here, and only one track continues. Okay, what happened here? Some, somebody got eaten on that very spot thousands of years ago. Um, now bones, if you find bones, well, you know, the animal could have died and got buried here, and then it could have got washed up and buried somewhere else. So a lot of things can happen. Not so with tracks. They'll get destroyed. So we know that this happened right here at this spot. <clears throat> well, here's a typical tracks that we find in the Coconino sandstone. Nice little animal tracks with the, the toes. You can see their toe marks, toe prints, and the paw prints. Um, and the question is, how did they form? This is, the, this is the standard accepted geological explanation for that sandstone. It was a desert, they believe. Uh, Wind-blown sand making these dunes and animals are walking around. It, it's what we call cross-bedded sandstone in, in these sloping layers. So here you have a set of sloping layers thought to have been sand dunes. Then another set of dunes comes across and makes more layers. And the tracks are on these sloping layers. Is it really dunes? This is in a, the lower third of the geologic column. I would think that would be in the flood. And so I wondered, uh, is this the correct explanation uh, of these? <clears throat> well, do I have reason to, to consider any other alternatives? Actually, I do. Here's a desert sand dune. Here are some more dunes. But these are not in a desert. This is under the ocean. Uh, they're called sand waves. W wind and water do very similar things to sand. And in fact, this has been a, a, a big challenge in geology to figure out. How do you tell a difference between a water-deposited dune or a wind-deposited dune? And the geologists think they know now, but I, I'm not so sure. Um, and so if they're um, on a desert dune, you'd make, they'd make tracks. If they're underwater, they could swim down and make tracks. And so we have two options to consider. Which one uh, matches the tracks uh, better? Well, we did a lot of work out there in, in the canyon, uh, studying these trackways on the slopes. Um, and then to try to understand them, um, I had a graduate student make an artificial sand dune for me in the lab uh, with this sand in a, on these sloping layers. And also in an aquarium, we'd have these sloping layers. We could watch salamanders and lizards make tracks and see which ones match the fossil tracks. Well, here's a, a big slab of that sandstone, 12 feet high. And here, here you have a trackway <clears throat> going straight up. Um, and, you know, the interesting thing, all the animals are going up the dune. Well, why are they not going back down? Uh, there's, in fact, there's a whole sign of a paper written on one trackway that seemed to be going down. It was so unusual, they published a paper on it. So they're all going up. Why? Well, this would have been going up, and this animal is walking like you'd expect animals to walk. And their toes will always point in the average in the direction they're moving. But what about these? See, well, yeah, you think, sure, he's walking that way, and he's walking this way. But all these tracks have one thing in common. All the toe prints are pointing straight up, this way, not to the side. It's like this. Some of them are going sideways, but the toes, on average, are pointing upward, just like these. So how does that happen? Uh, you ever tried running across the basketball court sideways? You might not want to try it. You'll end up with a broken leg like, like um, our friend down here has. Um, but look at these. these. This trackway, the toes are all pointing this way. But the animal is going that way. How does that happen? Um, animals don't walk that way. Maybe in the flood. So why would he? Why would the flood do that? <laughs> okay. Yeah. In in the in the water. Well, either on a sand dune or underwater, 
You can have the main current comes over the dune, but you can have shifting lateral currents, uh, which could move in a, on a desert dune. It's not going to do much to a big animal, but underwater it could it could drift him sideways, and he could be drifting sideways and trying to walk this way, but he's moving that way. Well, I wondered if that could be the case. So I did some experiments in a lab. So here you have a, a, a what we call a flume. It's like a big aquarium. Water was flowing this way, and the animals were walking on the sand. And sometimes they'd walk, you know, with, as you'd expect. But this is one example where the animal is trying to walk that way. The water is drifting him this way. And when they do that, they make tracks that look just like the fossil tracks. OK. Um, I have to explain a little more before I get to this one. So they, they, they walk, uh, they'll, they'll try to walk this way. They very laboriously keep walking, but they're drifting sideways. And their tracks exactly match the things we see in the fossil tracks. Tracks uh, look like the animals drifting sideways. OK, so that's, I don't know how you'd explain that in a desert. But there's more. What if you saw this? You've got to start somewhere, OK? If you're out on a walk in the desert, have you ever had this happen? Um, how would you explain that? Well, we do find fossil tracks like that. Here's one. The, the animal is walking this way. But if we follow backwards, then there should be a track here and another one here. But there's nothing there. It's just a smooth, undisturbed surface. Where did he come from? That's a puzzle. Here's another one. This is my, the best one I've seen. The animal is walking here. Then this trackway disappears, and it reappears up here. It keeps going. So how did that happen? Well, if he's in a desert, I don't know of any way that could happen. And nobody's been able to explain to me how it could happen. If it's underwater, that's simple. They swim down and walk, and then swim back up. And I found several of these in that sandstone. And so you know, other geologists don't like my explanation of these being underwater. Um, but they've not, they, and they tried to explain those sideways tracks, but nobody has even tried to explain the, the tracks have stopped suddenly. I think it's pretty convincing evidence this had to be underwater. And I was able to get some good articles published in the scientific literature on this. Okay, we'll go quickly through this. Taphonomy of fossil whales in Peru. Uh, several of us were down in Peru giving some lectures at our uni university there and, and in town of Lima about creation. And somebody said, you want to see some fossil whales? Well, we had no idea if they were really going to be whales or not. But it turned out they are. There are there's this formation, the Pisco Formation, on the west coast of Peru. It's in the, the driest desert in the world. Um, <clears throat> there are no plants to, to obscure these fossils and rocks. And there are thousands of fossil whales there preserved. Uh, not yet, not, not so fast on the slides. Okay, this is one of our camp. We usually stayed in town. It wasn't really safe to camp much, but if we're way out in the boonies where nobody knew where we were, we'd camp. Uh, this, this morning I told about this fellow called Mario. There's Mario, dear friend of ours, uh, helping us cook our meal. Well, okay, we study these, these whales, and there are, there are many beautiful fossils there in, in that deposit, and they're all beautifully preserved, just like and the, the um, fossils in the, in the uh, Green River Formation. Shark teeth, and they have a whole shark skeleton. And sharks don't have bones. They have cartilage. This had to have been buried very fast. Here's a fish, uh, and uh, I think that's a penguin. And, but whale, we were interested in the whales. There are just so many whales. Whales are huge creatures. They have a big skull. This is the whale's skull. They have baleen in the mouth. It's not bone. It's, it's like your fingernails. Uh, and we find all these huge whales, again, and they're beautifully preserved. The, the, this has baleen right in there, and many of them do. There's another whale as it appears out in the desert. Now, what happens to it when a whale dies? The, the, when we got there, <clears throat> we saw these whales. Something struck us immediately. There was a problem. Because this is all being explained as sediment that accumulates just a few centimeters thick per thousand years. Mostly it's diatom skeletons, these minute little creatures that live in the water. 
okay, a few centimeters per thousand years. But here you have all these beautifully preserved whales. How could that, could, could a whale lie there for 10,000 years and still be preserved? Well, we had our doubts. And, and others have studied this formation for 20 years, and they'd never paid attention to this. It hadn't really hit them that there's a problem. It hit us immediately. Something is wrong. And again, our biblical worldview, our catastrophic worldview, caused us to ask questions that other people are not asking. So what happens when a whale dies? Well, there are people who study that today. Uh, whales die off the coast of California, and they, they follow with you know, submersibles what's happening. Uh, just thousands of creatures uh, immediately descend on that whale, because it's a lot of food. And so they take advantage of it. And within a few months, maybe six months, the whale is like this. The, the flesh is all gone. And then the next uh, crew comes in and begins to burrow into the bones. Uh, and, and in a few years, the bones are gone. So 10,000 years to bury a whale, there's no possibility that could happen. It had to, if to preserve these whales in the beautiful condition they are, they had to have been buried uh, very fast. And so here they are. Um, and we, we studied hundreds of these. Uh, and here's the one we all liked. Uh, this is all its baleen. The baleen was all right there. Baleen doesn't last very long in a whale now. When the animal dies, the baleen falls out. It's not even bone, and it doesn't it gets chewed up. Uh, and so it's like this stuff here, and there it is. And this, this whale's body is back there. We like this whale because each of us could to pose for a picture with the whale that we found. Yeah. <clears throat> and so how does that happen? Well, this is our favorite whale uh, called Fernanda. We gave him a, a name. Um, one of the, my student worked with me. Um, called home and told his wife about this. We were naming the whales, and he, she said, well, you better not name a whale after me. Um, but look at this thing. It's all there, and the bones are not chewed by, other, by these invertebrates. It's all beautifully preserved. And right here is something. This is a slab of the baleen. It came out of the mouth and landed right there. Okay, and here it is. This is a close-up, and this is the surface right there with a baleen plate. And this material I sent to a, to a, uh, a geologist a, a, who's a molecular biologist, studies ancient uh, biomolecules. Okay, this thing is supposedly 12 million, million years old, but this is protein. Okay, she identified this, this is protein, exquisitely preserved. How do you do that? Well, proteins won't last that long. And so this thing, not only were these whales buried fast, but it couldn't have been that long ago. We, we located the fossils with this um, uh, GPS device. So you, in each whale, you, you get the location of it. And we could map where they were. This is our main study area. This is about a square mile, and every dot is a whale. Okay, and these whales, these are obviously whales that were pretty much intact when they were buried. Now, dam, uh, modern damage has, has messed a lot of them up. But they're all beautifully whales. So many whales. And this deposit, this formation goes for 200 kilometers. So there's just an awful lot of whales that had to have been buried very fast. And we got it, again, you do careful work and you get it published. This is the most prestigious journal in the field of geology. And there's our whale on the cover. And I had an interesting thing happen when I was, wrote this manuscript, um, which was showing that because of the well-preserved whales, this sediment has to have been accumulated very fast, not a little bit per ten th for a thousand years. And one of the reviewers, I know who this was, when I say reviewers, you send in a manuscript, they send it to maybe three experts in the field who evaluate it and tell you whether they think it should be published. Well, this one, this one reviewer, I know who it is, and she's one of the top taphonomists in the world. And um, when I was writing it, <clears throat> From the, from the evidence we had, it looked to me like each whale had to have been buried within weeks or, or months at most. But that's not a, 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 that's not a well-liked idea out there in geology. And I thought, that'll never get published. So I took it out a little bit, and I said, months to a few years. Well, this reviewer, who's clearly you know, a conventional thinking geologist, she read it, and she said, well, your evidence says it, it had to be faster. It had to be weeks or months, at most. 
So I put it back in and it got published. <coughs> so if you do careful work, you can get it published, even though people may not like your overall point of view. So just conclusions. We've got some unanswered questions. Why the fossils are, are in this or why there's no humans down here? And the radiometric dating. So those are our, kind of our big unanswered questions. There are others too. There's so much to study. It, it's, um, you take many lifetimes to do it all. But those are the big ones. But then we have answers. Evidence we get from, from re, our own research and from just studying the rocks in general. These well-preserved fossils point to rapid burial. Coal had to have been happened on a catastrophic way. Bedded rocks, which are all through the geologic column, they speak of rapid uh, processes. And then when we, when we go out and do research and we let the Bible open our minds to new ideas, let it open our, our eyes to see things that other people have not seen and to ask questions that other people are not asking, then we find, we find answers. Um, we find evidence for short time and, and water action, uh, catastrophic water action. And we do careful research with uh, biblical insights. And publication, public in, in, in publishing in scientific journals is quality control. I better do my work carefully or somebody's going to shoot it down. And so we try to do that whenever we can. And so doing all this um, is a very rewarding process. And we have to live with unanswered questions. Everybody does. There are many Christians who feel that they, they have to have all the answers from science. Well, that's not realistic. Um, it would take too many lifetimes for, for thousands of us working to find the answers. And we're studying things that happened long ago. We can't see how it happened. We tell stories and try to support them. Um, so we have to all live with unanswered questions. Everybody does. Uh, but answers can come gradually, one at a time from careful search, and progress comes from taking the Bible as our guide, even in scientific research. And we find that there are abundant reasons to trust God's Word. So, thank you.